Remain standing. I'll sing Gayatri Mantra and then we'll have a prayer together. Om Bhur Bhuva Swaha Om Tatsavet Varaniyam Bhargo Devasya Vimahi Niyo Yonaha Prachodayat Om Let's pray together. We always pray to God and to our gurus as instruments of God who have come to bless our lives. Heavenly Father, Divine Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashai, Swami Sri Yukteswar, Beloved Guru, Paramahansa Yogananda, Saints of all religions, we bow to all of you. Divine Mother, may thy love shine forever on the sanctuary of our devotion. And may we be able to awaken thy love in all hearts. Om. Peace. Amen. Be seated. Now, <clears throat> in case you think that uh, coming out here the way I did, I'm an Olympic athlete, <laughs> I have to say that I really can't stand through this whole talk, so I'll sit down. And uh, I want to begin by reading a conversation from Yogananda. Every Sunday, I plan to read from this book. In India, for several years, I had a television program based on this book, and it went to some 20 million homes all over the country. And uh, I really am very happy with this book. Many times, Master, I call Yogananda Master, but not in the sense that he was, uh, that I was a slave and he was a slave master. I mean, he was one who was completely the master <coughs> of his own self. He is someone whom I could look to for teaching. When I first met him, I was desperate for truth, really to the point of um, I just didn't know what I'd do if I didn't find him, if I wasn't accepted by him. While I was sitting in his interview room at Hollywood Church, I kept praying, you've got to accept me. I know I, I can't say what I feel because I know I'd only cry, but you must listen to me. And he listened to my heart and he accepted me that day. And he said to me, I give you my unconditional love. And he's asked me for mine. Then he said, will you give me your unconditional obedience? Well, as desperate as I was, I had to be truthful. And so I said, sir, I would, <clears throat> what if I think you're wrong sometime? And he said, I will never ask anything of you that God does not tell me to ask. And I found this to be true all the years that I knew him. I was with him for three and a half years, which is longer than the disciples of Jesus got to be with Jesus. I, he told me early in my life with him that I had a great work to do. And one, the three things that he specifically asked of me were that I write, edit, and lecture. In the writing, he told me to write down everything he said. And often he would have me up in his interview room when he had guests and I would sit there writing down the things he said. This is one particular conversation that I want to read to you that he had in his interview room. A professor from Columbia University came to lunch with the master in his third floor interview room at Mount Washington. I served them 
and was able afterward to sit in the room and take notes while they conversed. At a certain point in their discussion, the professor asked, do your teachings help people to be at peace with themselves? They do indeed, the master answered, but as the, 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 that is the least that they do. We teach people above all how to be at peace with their creator. Now this is a very important statement. Most people think that peace is something they want in themselves only. People cut God out of their lives. I used to try to do that. Science does it constantly. I used to try because I was a member of the, well, I can't say I was a member. My mother went to the Episcopal Church, and as a result, I was in the Episcopal Church. But I found it dead. There was no inspiration. There was no joy. There was just dogma and uh, ranting. And <clears throat> I decided I, I needed to know truth. But... I had to find a truth that was not spiritual. And so I began with science. And I tried to be an astronomer. And I thought, what difference does it make to me whether there is one galaxy or a hundred billion galaxies? There's got to be more to that. If I can't find a truth that inspires me, then it's, it's, uh, that's not what I'm looking for. I want something that will make me a better person. So astronomy wasn't the answer. Then I thought, well, maybe a political system. And I tried different things and thought a great deal. Mind you, I was fairly young at the time. I was 13, 14. But I was really seriously seeking the truth, even from younger than that. And uh, I, <clears throat> I realized in time that systems won't make you any better than you are. You make the systems. The systems can't make you... Years later, when, well, a year later, when Master put me in charge of the other monks, I realized that rules aren't going to do it. And he said this, too. Don't make too many rules. They destroy the spirit. It's very important to understand that perfection cannot come through rules, through obedience to people. You know, one interesting thing he said was that obedience to a guru is liberating. But obedience to one who is not enlightened can be deadening, can stifle your willpower. And so um, I, I told the monks when, was, when he put me in charge, I said, I don't want you to obey me. I want you to obey the, <clears throat> I want you to cooperate with me. And I, too, will cooperate with you in any way that I can if it doesn't go against my principles and our way of life. And so always I tried to make people understand that the main thing they had to be was obedient to their own higher self. Monasteries in which nuns are taught to plant plants upside down in the ground completely, <clears throat> sorry, my voice isn't very good today, completely against all principles of common sense. And uh, they think that obedience means blind obedience. Master never gave us, demanded of us, blind obedience. Yes, obedience, but blind, no, he helped us to understand. There was one time, however, I remember he was telling me constantly because My nature was too intellectual, and he wanted me to get more devotion. And even with that constant desire, I was intellectual, yes, but I desperately wanted to develop my heart feelings. And then he made me write letters. I might write articles for the magazine and do other um, intellectual things, studying the lessons that... Le he gave me all the lessons to study uh, as quickly as possible. He was giving me a crash course, you might say, to help make me ready 
to teach other people. And uh, I got quite upset with him at one moment because I thought that uh, here he wants me not to be intellectual, but he wants me to do intellectual things. And I, <clears throat> I realized in time that he didn't mean to suppress my intellect. To be devotional doesn't mean to be stupid. He wanted me to develop both sides of my nature and equally. I went through a period of doubt at, at that time and I came to realize that the way out of doubt is love. The whole spiritual path may be summed up in that one word, love. I realized a few months ago why I should love, why we should love everybody in this world because everybody is seeking the same thing. We're all seeking bliss. We all want that bliss of Divine Mother and of God. Well, Divine Mother is God. But you know, I've been raised in the tradition of God being a He. I know He's not. And I pray to God really as the Divine Mother. So when Master said we must make our peace with the Creator, what it means is that we must expand our consciousness to refer everything that we do not to ourselves, not to human applause, not to anything outward, but everything back to the Creator. I have found that if I ask myself, is this what you want, God? Just that simple question. And you can be fairly blunt with him sometimes. He doesn't mind it. God has no ego to defend. But I remember one time I had felt guided by the Divine Mother, as I felt it, to return to India after 10 years. And I had enough money to go and be there for two months, but only that much. Then I had to come back. And two weeks before I was to leave, I had this um, difficulty with my car. It threw a rod, and I realized I had to get rid of it. But I thought if I buy another car, even a good used car, then I won't have the money to go to India. And if I don't, I live up there in the mountains. How can I get around without a, some sort of conveyance? And so I prayed <coughs> to Divine Mother. I said, my common sense tells me that I should have a car. So Divine Mother, I'm going to get one. And uh, if you still want me to go to India, you're going to have to reimburse me. <laughs> That's the way I prayed. And I believe in that kind of prayer. You can talk frankly with God. You know, the wonderful thing of that, that experience was Friday evening, I spent $1,100 on a good used car. It's Monday morning in the mail. I got a check from somebody I'd never heard of before. And it contained a check for $1,000 made out to me personally, not to Ananda. And it said, use this as Divine Mother wants you to. How many people in America think of God as the Divine Mother? Very few. But that sweetness of the Divine Mother is always there. I think of God as the Mother because the Mother, as Master said, is closer than the Father. I believe in seeking God according to the principles of self-realization. That is to say, Master said that someday self-realization will be the religion of the world. And he didn't mean self-realization fellowship. He meant that every person will understand that God must be sought individually in the self. Master said to us one time that God, <coughs> you must make God, make love to God individually that it's not enough just to live here. He said, there are plenty of rats and mice living in the canyon here on this property, but they aren't advancing spiritually. They aren't seeking God. They aren't coming closer to him. So he must individually make love to God. One of the difficulties with an organization is the thought that it's being done for you. 
You have to do it. And you have to do it with kindness. I think one of the most important qualities on the spiritual path is kindness. To see God in everyone. To be humble. Not to compete with other people. To realize that he is in everyone you meet. I have found that if I... Master used to say that uh, whenever you see a sad face, Shoot him with the buckshot of your smiles. <laughs> and uh, in fact, I have found that if you greet people with kindness and with love, even strangers will somehow be changed. I, I had a marvelous experience of that kind in Paris many years ago. It was my birthday, and uh, there was, I wanted to go to a concert. And when I got to the door, they were closing the door. There were 50 people outside. And they said, I'm sorry, there's no room. And I said in French, but it's my birthday. And so the man said, oh, well, happy birthday. Come in. <laughs> so he couldn't put me in the orchestra, in the audience, because it was full. So he had to put me up. It was a church up by the altar with just a handful of about five or six people. And afterwards, it was wonderful music, and I felt great joy in it. But afterwards, I was on the metro, on the subway, and a little old lady came up to me, and she said, do you remember me? I said, well, no. But I was in the audience. Well, there were 700 people in that audience. How could she feel that I should know her particularly? But you know, when you feel this kind of thing in your heart, People feel they knew you. And that was what it was then. And she sat down and started confiding in me trouble that she was having with her daughter and all sorts of things to a complete stranger. But you will find that the more you look at everybody like this, the more they will start to greet you as your own friends. It's a wonderful way of life to know that wherever you go, you have friends. Because God is in everybody. They don't know it necessarily. In fact, very few people know it. But one thought, thought remains in the mind as a very important one. God is, was defined by Swami Shankaracharya as Satchitananda, ever-existing, ever-conscious. And Master added something very important, ever new bliss. That bliss is what we are made of. We are his manifestations. We are not his creations. We're manifestations of that bliss. And all of us are therefore impelled to seek that bliss of our own nature. You can't get away from it. Master told the story of a musk deer, which at a certain time in the year secretes a certain pouch in its navel from which the odor of musk comes. And the musk deer in, goes almost crazy looking for the source of this musk. And sometimes it throws itself off a high crag looking for this musk scent. And the poet that Master quoted said, Oh musk deer, if only you had realized that what you were looking for was, your, was in your own self. And so that which everybody in the world is seeking is already in his own self. We are impelled by our own nature to seek who we are and what we are. And most people, almost everybody, they think, well, I'll find it in money, I'll find it in sex, I'll find it in pleasure, I'll find it in fame and name and all the things that people seek. You know, it, it's a long path. It's not a quick path. After all, the greatest treasure in the universe is there as a prize for you when you find what you're looking for. I remember in the Hollywood church many years ago, someone said to me, I've been meditating six months and I haven't had samadhi yet. <laughs> Well, 
you know, you have to make it seem easy. Because in a sense it is easy. Although I once said to Master, because somebody had had a vision of being with Master on Lemuria, whether it was a true vision or not, I really don't know. But <clears throat> I said to Master, have I been your disciple for thousands of years? It was a scary thought to me. He said, it's been a long time, that's all I'll say. And one time that same disciple said to him, Sir, I don't think I have very good karma. And Master replied, remember this, it takes very, very, very good karma even to want to know God. So we have been incarnating how many lifetimes? In the Bhagavad Gita, it says at the beginning of a day of Brahma, when all is brought outward into creation, we are manifested. I throw all these people out into manifestation again. And in the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam, which Master also interpreted, it says, but in a very esoteric way, that many people who were born into Maya, into delusion, at the beginning of the day of Brahma, are still wandering in delusion at the end of that day. And the question can arise very easily. Have we been going for more than one day of Brahma? I begin to think that it's possible. I don't want to frighten you, but I want you to know how serious it is to seek God. There's no other answer in life. People get hung up on the, <clears throat> on the, the events of one lifetime. You have to go through many. If you look at the people in this audience, if you look at the people walking down the streets of Los Angeles, everybody has different qualities of personality that he has gathered over <clears throat> many incarnations. And everybody is different, not in himself. Of course in ourselves we're different. That's the beauty of that particular phrase, ever new bliss. Ever new means that it is also in every individual. We all will find that bliss, and when we do, we'll, it will be to us a particular experience. Every saint when you get rid of your ego, when you reach the point where you understand that you are, your main goal in life is to realize that your oneness with him. When you get rid of the ego and all your self-definitions, then you will see that no two saints are exactly alike. Yes, they all love God. Yes, they're all humble. Yes, they're all full of divine bliss, but apart from that, everyone is unique. And in their uniqueness, it stands in sharp contrast how very much the same other people are. Americans act like Americans. Germans act like Germans. Men try to act like men. Women try to act like women. We're all, that's all just superficial stuff. We are really inside ourselves, that same bliss, but each one expresses that bliss uniquely. I had a dream, which was a very real dream, a few years ago in Florence, in Italy. And uh, <clears throat> I saw in this dream men, women of all different types and so on. But I saw that underneath what they thought they wanted, Everybody was looking for the same bliss. It was so inspiring. I just felt this love pouring out to everybody. I want to talk about that kindness. That was the salient feature of Master's life. I never knew anyone so absolutely kind. There was a beautiful story. I've told it in The New Path, my book, where Master was going with Debbie Mukherjee and one, one or two other people, but it was Debbie who told me the story. 
He was going by car. And all of a sudden, he said, stop, stop, stop the car. He got out and walked back a few shops, entered a variety shop, and bought a number of little items there. He had no use for them. It was basically junk that he bought. And Debbie thought, what is he doing buying this junk? He went to the counter, and when he paid the woman, she burst into tears. She said, I badly needed just this amount of money today. And you have brought just this amount, just, just a closing time, and it looked as if I would not get it. She said, bless you. God himself must have sent you. You know, another wonderful thing about Master was he didn't talk about it. He didn't dwell on this thought. He didn't even mention it. He never talked of his miracles. He was very reticent in some ways. Discipleship, his miracles, his greatness, these things he kept quiet. You know, if you were to try to make a movie of Yogananda's life, it would be very difficult. Because he is Arjuna, and he said, in fact, that he was Arjuna in a former life. But he said that even Arjuna said the same thing. He was always acting like a humble disciple. And I think part of the real charm, perhaps the most, the greatest charm of autobiography of a yogi is his perfectly beautiful attitude under all circumstances. But with that attitude, he, he faced himself. You get the impression in reading autobiography of a yogi First of all, I could do that. That's a wonderful thing to convey. But the other side of that is that you get the impression that he did it and I can do just the same thing. And you don't understand what a very great master are you reading his life of. I know in his last years, he used to talk to us about his early years and being with the masters. I remember him saying to me that... Uh, all those saints I went to, they kept asking me questions. I wanted to learn from them, but they were asking questions of me. They used to call him Chotho Mahashai, which is to say little saint. Mahashai, again, he didn't translate it right. He just said little sir, but Mahashai means great soul. So he didn't, he, he, he effaced, effaced himself. Actually, I've written a movie now the script for a movie, and there are a number of people eager to turn it into a movie. It's called The Way Shower. And in this movie, I show something of his greatness as a, as a man, as a master. And you feel the inspiration that autobiography can share, but an ordinary actor he couldn't share. I told about miracles. For example, there was this one in Encinitas, where he had a group of, I don't know, maybe 12 guests. And uh, because they have a processing plant there which made carrot juice, he asked one of the monks to go and get this carrot juice. And the monk came back and he said, Sir, there's only a small glass left. We don't have any right now. And Master said, Well, bring that. And so he brought it. And Master said, Pour it out. And he poured it, and he managed to fill everybody's glass. Master didn't say anything. Most of the guests didn't realize what was happening. But he just kept that glass full all the time. He, he told me about two, th two times at least when he brought people who had died back to life. These are the sort of miracles that we know Jesus performed. Not only Jesus, other great saints have performed them. But Master did all these things and never talked about it. I remember one time, I was, this is not a great miracle, but it was a sweet miracle. Norman and I, to my fellow monk and I, disciple, were plastering the garage near the e entrance to Mount Washington. And the plaster was old and it kept getting hard. And I had to keep pouring water to keep on mixing it so it would be hard, soft enough to put on the wall of the garage. And we had just poured a new hod of mud, as we called it, 
when his car drove up and he called us to him. So, of course, we left it and went over to him. We weren't going to say to our guru, I'm sorry, sir, we're busy. But all the time that I was talking with him, it was about half an hour. And all the time he held us there talking, I was thinking, well, when I get back to that board, it's going to be cement. And I didn't know what to do about it, but I thought this is much more important to be with him. And when we got back to that board, he didn't say anything. We didn't say anything. Certainly, we weren't, we weren't going to say, Master, could you please let us go back to that mud. But when we got back, it was soft, still soft. And it remained soft for the rest of the day. He never said anything. I never said anything. But how many things like that I saw. I remember one time I was invited. I used to do the yoga postures. And it was another miracle because I could do them fairly well, but basic ones I couldn't do. At one time, there was a small group of us, and uh, he um, had us do the yoga postures for this guest. And uh, I suddenly found in his presence I could do them all perfectly, so much so that from then on, I was the person selected to demonstrate the yoga postures. And so I was invited to this bar mitzvah or whatever it was. I think it was a bar mitzvah, but forgive me, I'm not Jewish. Uh, in Los Angeles, you almost have to apologize. <laughs> but uh, I mean, everywhere you go, you see these Jewish signs. So. Anyway, um, after I'd done these, one of these skeptical Beverly Hills psychiatrists came up to me and he was talking and challenging everything. And finally, in desperation, I told him of a couple of miracles I had seen. And I could see in his mind that he was sort of thinking, well, I can see this patient on Wednesday at 10 a.m. <laughs> he, he thought I was crazy. And so the next day, now two days later, I was with Master in his interview room. He, I used to serve his guests and so on. And uh, he, after the guests left, he would often have me just sit there and chat with me. And <clears throat> on this occasion, he stopped whatever he was saying and said, oh, by the way, when you're with skeptics and atheists, don't talk about miracles. <laughs> and I said, you knew. Now, this is the most astonishing thing I, I can imagine. He said, I know every single thought you think. It's an astounding thing to say. I mean, I'm just one little disciple. He must have known everybody's thoughts. In fact, in his poem, Samadhi, he talks about all thoughts of all men, past, present, to come. I remember one night I had a very strange experience. All this was new to me. I'd never studied Indian philosophy. I'd never read anything spiritual. I had avoided it until finally my reasoning brought me to the point where I saw that there could only be one answer to it all, and that was God. And I remember going out into the night one night, into the darkening evening, and saying to myself, if there's a God, what must he be like? And I suddenly it came to me, obviously he's not a, police officer or a judge or someone waiting grimly to throw me into hell for eternity? He must be. Well, what's making me ask this question? Science tells us that our thoughts are just movement of energy in the brain, that we're not, our consciousness is produced by the brain. Well, that would mean that we were robots. And many a scientist would agree happily with that definition. Well, you can program a robot maybe to eat something. You cannot program any robot to ask questions like this. And I said, what is God? What is the meaning of life? And I thought, what is making me ask this question? It's because I'm conscious. And my consciousness is not something I have produced. It's something I manifest. 
And the fact that I am conscious means he must be consciousness. And being consciousness, I'm a part of that consciousness. And then the goal of life has to be to seek God. I remember thinking I was going crazy. I'd never heard of anybody being, being a saint. I didn't know what saints were. I thought they were kindly old men who patted little children on the head or something. But somebody who knew God, I didn't know that that was even thinkable until I thought it. I had no outward influence to inspire me. But my own thinking led me to this conclusion. And I was so desperate for truth that I decided absolutely then and there that I was going to devote my life to seeking God. Yes, I thought I was going crazy. For a while I thought, I've got to get out in the country among simple country folk and enjoy nature. Maybe then I'll have peace of mind and all this big struggle will be over. So I went upstate New York to Indian Lake. And the first thing I found was that country people were, if anything, more um, dull-witted than city people. And the worst of it was that I was dull. I would look at the dewdrop glimmering on a leaf, and I would see the rainbow colors in it. And I would say, yes, that's beautiful. But I can't feel it. What's the matter with me? I'm, an, I'm a motor working on one cylinder. There's something I've got to change in me. It isn't my environment, but it will do it. And I remember coming back, my father had been posted to Egypt, and my mother was going to join him. And the day I put her on the ship to go to Egypt, I walked up to town, New York, and I had had a little touch of Indian teachings, enough to make me intrigued. And I went into Doubleday Duran, which is what his name was then, and I saw Autobiography of a Yogi. It absolutely changed my life. I can't describe what that book did to me. It moved me to tears of laughter and tears of joy. I couldn't sleep for two days, three days, just barely minimum, because I had to get back to that book. And as soon as I'd finished that book, I took the next bus across the country, and the words I said to him when I met him were, I want to be your disciple. And he accepted me, as I said. I'm his disciple. I'm not his organization's disciple. After his death, his organization tried to make me obedient to them. But he had told me things I had to do. You know, the reason I, in that book that I wrote recently, um, Rescuing Yogananda, I mentioned Ayamata quite a few times in not very flattering ways. I'm sorry for having had to do that, but the truth is that the head of an organization always sets the tone and the spirit of that organization. Otherwise, I love her. I was a close friend of hers, and I wish her only well. I hope my book helps her, but it's true that I do feel that there is a need to bring kindness back into that organization. Less judgment, less coldness. This is what we have two rules at Ananda that are paramount in our dealing with people. First is people are more important than things. Pe things means not only things, but projects, etc. Many times in my developing of Ananda, we've been there over 40 years now, and we're glowing success. But many times I have had to choose between what was good for the person and what was needed from the person for the work. Always I have rigidly said, if it isn't good for you, then I won't ask you to do it. And sometimes we've had to abandon a project because we couldn't find anybody who would gain from it himself. But this is a principle of mine that I have clung to, you might say rigidly. I'm not rigid in my nature, but I'm very rigid when it comes to truth as I understand it. 
And so we've always put people and their needs ahead of the needs of the organization. The other principle we have is one that is known in India as Yatha Dharma Satajaya. I know it was the motto of the Raja Maharaja of Kuch Behar, Jato Dharma Tato Jaya. And uh, where there is right action, there is victory, there is happiness, there is success. Everything good comes from adhering rigidly to what you believe to be true. I have always tried to do that. I, <clears throat> I feel the most important thing on the path of all, however, and I have to watch this clock here because uh, um, I want to give you time also to ask your questions. But uh, I have found that by getting rid of this sense of I, by always saying, you were the doer. I remember one time I was giving the lecture at Hollywood Church, and uh, later somebody said to me, what a good lecture that was. And I said, God is the doer. She said, oh, really? As if I, I knew it was good. I didn't know it was that good. Well, that's not, that's not quite what I meant. I meant that if you feel that everything that you do, God is doing through you, that includes your sins. That includes your mistakes. Give them all to God. He knows that you're weak. He knows that you're struggling. He knows that you are looking for his bliss and sometimes mistakenly. But he will always, if you give it to him, nishkam karma, action without desire for the fruits of action, is the principle of the Bhagavad Gita. And if you have that attitude, you will find that he will come in and give you the strength. You know, the wonderful thing about these illusions, you have qualities that you think you'll never lose. They define you as you know yourself. You think, okay, how can I ever give up? my love for money, for example. When you've gotten over a delusion, you'll be so much over it that you'll hardly recognize yourself. You'll hardly be able to believe that you had that quality. It's so foreign to you. So once you've overcome delusion, it is overcome completely. You realize, I am not that. It's, we have to learn that we have to give up everything except our desire for God. Fame, name, recognition, these don't mean anything. And so it is that make it a practice every day to say, to, to ask yourself, is my ego involved in this? If you do, you will gradually find that you will let him work through you in everything. You know what will happen is that if you let God be the doer, that you will be able to do a thousand times more and a thousand times better than if you try to do it with your own ego. So I don't mean let God be the doer and you put your feet up on the desk and sit back. I don't mean that at all. I've certainly done enough in my life to demonstrate that truth, that I have to do a lot. But I don't feel I'm doing it. I've written over 400 pieces of music. I've never felt that I've written a note. And as a result, if I have a song I want to write, or a piece of music, I don't think I want the note to go this way, the melody to go that way. No, I just say, God, I want to say this, this, and this. Give me a melody. And he gives it to me. You will find that the more you let him be the doer, the more successful you will be. And there's no effort involved in the doing. It comes effortlessly. So the life for God, what Master said here about to be at peace with the Creator, everything you do, refer back to him. Before you do anything, ask yourself, is this your will? I don't think I've done anything in many, many years that has been because I wanted to do it. I have felt guided 
Sometimes it's taken courage. Sometimes it's taken having to face a lot of anger. But I have rigidly adhered to that. If he feels, if I feel that he wants me to do it, I will do it. You will live that way. And if you do, you will find bliss. Bliss is the goal of all life. Joy to you. Now I would like to ask if you have questions. And because I'm practically as deaf as a stone, I'll ask Jyotish to come up. And if I don't hear you, he will tell me what you've said. Okay, so questions. Is it possible that another avatar has come to Earth since Yogananda? Has, has come to Earth since Yogananda? Of course it's possible. In fact, it's almost inevitable. The Gita says that when virtue declines and evil is in the ascendant, I incarnate on earth as an avatar to put evil in its place, to destroy evil. He doesn't say destroy evil doers, but to destroy evil and to put virtue on its place again. So many times these things happen. Yogananda is not by any means unique, except to the extent that every soul is unique. He came to tell us that what he is, we can be, because we already are, okay? Any other questions? Hi. Um, last week you told us that Los Angeles is a spiritual center of the United States. Can you speak more about that, please? He said that Benares is, I tell you, there was a, an ancient tradition that here in Southern California, there was at one time a very high civilization. They left their vibrations here. When I get off the plane in Los Angeles, I can feel those vibrations. There is something in the air of not just Los Angeles, but Southern California, and perhaps Los Angeles especially. The, uh, there were great masters living in California thousands of years ago. And there's another tradition that here will be born the next race of man. Whatever that means, I can't begin to guess. But I think what it basically means is that the next wave of spiritual enlightenment will flow from this city. You drive around the city and it doesn't look like it could be possible. <laughs> but there is something here. And you know, when I was first teaching in Los Angeles 61 years ago. And now, when I see the spirit now, there is so much improvement. I went to the Titans of Yoga. This is a premiere film they had out in Santa Monica recently. I was so pleased to see the spirit, not only of the people, but of the teachers. The people were open, smiling, happy. They were obviously, even though it was only hatha yoga, physical yoga, still they had a, a spiritual quality that was, I didn't see it 50 years ago, 60 years ago. And <clears throat> the teachers, I was very inspired to see that they were serious seekers. We've gone far beyond the, this will slim your hips, girls, way of the approaching yoga gone far beyond that and uh, we've come to the point where people are seriously seeking who they are what their truth is i saw this integrity in the teachers and i also was very pleased to see the respect they showed for one another i think respect is one of the most important qualities we can have master said to us once i want you to respect one another as you respect me. Okay? Any other questions? Hi, 
Thank you, Swami Kriyananda. Um, I just wanted to say hi, and it's nice to meet you in person. You want me? Just want to say hi and introduce right. It's nice to see you in person. Thank you. Um, I've been fortunate enough to find a guru, and I've been struggling. I've had to struggle with the issue of uh, master and discipleship. And say this again. She's been fortunate enough to find a guru, but she's been struggling with the issue of master and discipleship. So okay, I'm, what is your struggle? I'm in the votary period of applying for a discipleship, and the doubt comes. Uh, she's in a votary period of applying for discipleship, and doubts come. Okay. Do you have any just words of advice about being a disciple? Do you have words of advice about being a disciple? I would say, first of all, Go to somebody whom you think can inspire you individually. Discipleship really has to be through people who knew, who knew him or people who knew people who knew him. Master said to me one time something that is not a present dogma, but he said it to me personally. He said, you must have at least one physical contact with the guru. Does that leave all you poor slobs in the dark? Of course not. What it means is that those who knew him can pass that ray on. It's like a relay race. They have to pass the baton. I know when I was in SRF, I was told in, uh, with great insistence, don't feel that you have anything to do with helping individuals. Master will help them. Well, I have seen that that doesn't work. I saw over, because for a long time I tried to do that. My, felt, my job, I felt, was bringing people to him, and then he would take over, and I'd just leave the responsibility to him. But I saw that people continued to have needs. And if I wasn't there, somebody had to be there. And I realized the duty of the disciple is not just to bring people to the guru, but to act as instruments of the guru, it's with his inspiration that you can inspire other people. You must understand that a true disciple must try to be a, a channel for his guru. As it says in the Bible, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. That power is the important thing. Many people come to me and said, do I need a guru? I said, not at all, forget it. You don't need a guru. But if you need God, if you know that you want God, then you need a guru. And that guru has to be somebody who will take a certain interest in you. You'll have questions. You'll have needs. You'll have the need for personal inspiration. All of these things cannot be institutional. I've resisted very strongly. I'm a disciple of Param Hansa Yogananda. I'm not a disciple of any organization. The people at Ananda are told the same truth. Organizations mean nothing. They're just forms. It's the spirit that animates them, that makes them real or unreal. So to be a disciple of Master, try first of all to find someone who can inspire you personally. To be a disciple doesn't mean to be rigidly, blindly obedient. If you're loyal to anything or anyone, expect that person to be loyal to you. For you to give loyalty and receive none in return, I call that shameful. You must understand that true discipleship means above all not so much obedience as love. As Master used to pray, Divine Mother, naughty or good, I am thy child, and thou must release me. True discipleship means, above all, to love God in the Guru. I remember one time I was with him and we were editing his, uh, his commentaries on the Bhagavad Gita. And he was writing, and I was sitting at his feet. And I was thinking what a wonderful fortune it was to be his disciple. 
and he didn't say anything. But then when he finished his work, he asked me to help him to his feet. And just as close as, closer than I am to Jyothi's ear, he looked me in the eyes with his beatific smile, and he said, just a bulge of the ocean. So beautiful. He never accepted it personally, but he was acting as God's instrument. He never said, they're my disciples. They said, he said, they're God's disciples. And he said, I'm just a little wave on the ocean. Look to the ocean. But through such a person, you can begin to understand something of what that ocean is. Otherwise, without a guru, how can you get there? The ego is so much a part of your thinking. Everything you do is centered there. There's a technique he taught us. The ego is centered here in the medalla of Longata. Thus it is that when people are very egotistical, they tend to... They hold their... They say, looking at people down their noses. That's because the tension pulls their heads back. And you see some of these rock stars <laughs> all coming from here. But the more you concentrate here, mind you, it's not an overnight thing. This path doesn't produce 90-day wonders. But you will find that over time, as you concentrate here, you begin to feel your center here. Master said that a master does everything from here, not from here. Seems like such a simple truth. But when you feel it, you will feel such an expansion and so much bliss. But you need the influence of somebody without whom you can't get out of all the rationalizations. Everything you do is referred back to you, you. I, 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 I. Mine, 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 mine. Well, to get out of that ego, you need somebody who is out of it who can bring you out of it. You can't find your way out of that labyrinth without that kind of help. The uh, guru is like Ariadne in the theme, in the myth of Theseus, who found himself in the labyrinth, killed the Minotaur, but still couldn't get out, except that she had given him this thread. And the guru is that thread that leads you through all these all these diversions until finally you come out into the free light of the sun. So discipleship is essential for those who want God, but it must be understood as not an institutional thing. It's between you and God, first of all, and then the messenger whom God sends you. Okay? It's a very important point. And I'd be glad to try to answer further questions on it, or other questions if you have them. Yes. No, she, I've answered, well, all right, go ahead, sorry. Go ahead. Is, uh, is Krishna an avatar in the Vedantic sense, or yes. is Krishna God himself? No, Krishna is an avatar in the Vedantic sense. He was God himself, Master told us that Babaji, who is the first of our line of gurus, is an incarnation of Krishna. And uh, that, you know, an avatar is different from an ordinary siddhi, siddha, I mean, or ascended master, in that he has attained that freedom and then comes back into this world with the power of God himself to do things for other people. I was about to tell you a story about the uh, time when I was new on the path, and all these things were completely strange to me. And I'd heard about astral possession. I thought, well, this is far out. And I was stupid enough to really want to know more about it. So I remember one night I, was, I had a dream, and I can still see the dream in my mind. I was at a party and people all being convivial, when suddenly I had the thought, it's time for me to go and meet a disincarnate spirit. What a stupid fellow. Anyway, I, w I remember leaving the party, and there was this room with bare floorboards and nothing in the room. 
And I stood in the middle of the room, and I said, all right, I want to find out what this is all about. Come. All of a sudden, the floorboards began to heave up and down, and I found myself being sucked out the window, and there was a sound of ohm, very unpleasant, a sort of low vibration of ohm. And I found myself struggling to keep my consciousness, and I didn't know if I would win that struggle. And so I called out, Master! Like this, suddenly it vanished. So the night of that day, I asked Master about this experience, and he said, yes, it's a true experience. Don't be afraid, these things happen. And I, then he, he, however, then he asked me about it. And I thought, well, he had answered my prayer. Obviously, he knew about it. Why would he ask me questions? And I said, sir, didn't you know? And he, a little impatiently, it seemed, said, when you were one with God, you are God. That was an astounding statement. But in fact, every true avatar is God himself. God not in a physical form. God using a physical form to bring to you that infinite consciousness. Another very interesting thing to keep in mind. Jesus said, suffer little children to come unto me for of such is the kingdom of God. And when you think of the vast complexity of this universe, you think, can God be childish, childlike? Yes, he is. The more, as I said, when the more you reduce your sense of ego to zero, the more God can do anything and everything through you, the more you can accomplish. And so God, by being zero, by having no ego at all, he can do all this vast, complex universe. But the beautiful thing is that in himself, God is very simple. He's childlike, not childish, but childlike. I remember a funny episode that took place with Master. He, we were out of the desert retreat, and he was in the kitchen. We were with him there. And he asked somebody to bring him a bag. And he turned out the lights and we heard a little chuckle and wrapped a sort of crinkled paper. Finally, you know those little pistols that shoot sparks? Bzz, bzz, bzz. <laughs> he turned the light on. There was a little pistol in his hand shooting these sparks. Then he took another pistol and shot and a parachute went up and we watched solemnly as this parachute came down to, down to the floor. And he looked at me and he said, how do you like that, Walter? And I, I was absolutely floored. I had thought of a master as being very grave and solemn and everything. And I said, it's fine, sir. And then he looked at me. He said, suffer little children to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of God. And I found that he himself was completely childlike. It was absolutely beautiful seeing him. There's that beautiful story of the time he entered a hotel and uh, there was a drunkard there. And he came over to Master, perhaps he was, perhaps Master was wearing his orange robe or maybe he felt something. <clears throat> they say in vino veritas, sometimes when people are drunk they, they have deeper perceptions. And uh, he hugged Master like this and he said, hello there, Jesus Christ. And Master said, hello there. And he said, uh, he, he, he said, I felt a desire to help this person to understand what real bliss is, not alcohol, but something from inside. So he touched him with that bliss. And the man said, sort of reeling back, he said, Shay, what are you drinking? And <laughs> Master said, well, I'll tell you this, it has a lot of kick in it. <laughs> but he was so absolutely charming. I remember this one occasion I was with him, and uh, it was, uh, there had been somebody from Bengal who was a boxer, who somehow thought he could dance, and he insisted on putting on this performance. So there he was on the stage, and he was supposed to dance the part of a, of a hunter and also of the deer, which the hunter was, was uh, shooting. 
And this man was really quite a specimen. At one point, he was so bad as a dancer, and he came down to the footlights, so the orchestra stopped, came down, apologized for them. He said, they're just amateurs, you have to understand. And uh, then every time he passed them in his dancing, he get, oh, this is the rhythm and so on. He was completely off. It was so funny because he was such a bad dancer and uh, he played the part of the hunter, just all exaggerated movements. Finally, the deer was killed. And you had everybody heaved a sigh of relief. Now it's over. Oh no, we'd forgotten. He was also the hunter. And he picked the deer up and put it over his shoulder and did this sort of victory cake walk. And finally, we saw some of the orchestra going like this to the people on the sidelines. And the curtain began to come down. And you just saw it come to this point. He saw him turn like this. Then all you could see was his feet striding to express his anger. Master and I both were laughing till the tears came down our cheeks. And uh, later on, this master expressed, this guest, this boxer, expressed his outrage. Master tried to calm him and make him feel good. Master didn't continue laughing at him. He didn't laugh at anybody. He laughed with them. <coughs> but I remember there was one Bengali there who was visiting just he was in, in Los Angeles. And uh, he was sort of treating Master in a very familiar way, sort of hugging him and so on. Debbie Mukherjee, a friend of ours and a fellow disciple, made some comment in Bengali. Master said, don't. He didn't, he didn't, he respected everybody. It was so charming to see the respect he had. The image people project of him is of a stern disciplinarian. Well, that can be at times. If you take a disciple, you have to give that disciple what he needs. But there was one time, and I mentioned this also in my book, The New Path, when Jean Hope, the brother disciple, was in Master's interview room, and Master was scolding one of the nuns. Jean was at one end of the room, the nun was at the other. And Master was striding back and forth like this. And every time he faced her, he, you thought, think the roof would come off. And then he'd turn back, and he's back to her as he faced the other way. And he'd see Jean help, and he's sort of like that. And <laughs> but it was all a show. And you know, when you got to know him, you could feel that everything was done with kindness, with love. I have discovered something. The deeper the bliss you feel, the more decisive you become. And so it is that you're not a wimp when you feel bliss. You may sometimes come across as uh, overbearing, but you're not. It's just that you know what you want and you don't mince words. But underneath it all, Master was really just a child. It's so wonderful to have lived with him and to have lived so many years since he died. Because everything I do I always ask myself in my mind, is this what you want? Is this what you would do? And again and again, I can remember exact tone, inflections of his voice, his little gestures. Everything was a lesson. And I learned from just the expression in his eyes, from the movement of a smile, everything. It was incredible. He taught by just being. But to be his disciple, has been for me the greatest blessing of my life, the greatest blessing possible. And I'm here in Los Angeles to try to help people to understand who he really was. Can I ever do that? It's a hopeless task, but it's a necessary one. I need to help people to understand what a great soul they had walking in their midst here just a few years ago, the whole city is blessed by that presence. Any other questions? You had one. My question is about bliss. Last week you said that every point of duality, every negative of duality that you embrace will quickly come to a part. If you get pleasure, there will be pain. What is the duality? What is this?
question is about bliss. Last week you said everything. I heard is that. Okay. What is the duality of bliss? There is no duality to bliss. That's the beautiful thing. Bliss is the center between opposites. And there is no duality to bliss. There is duality to happiness. There is duality to anything emotional. Because that's tied up to the ego. But when God created the universe, he had to, that one consciousness had to divide itself. So for every up there had to be a down of the waves. For every plus there has to be a minus. And for happiness, you will find that if you're emotionally happy, you will have to pay for it. I think I told that story last time, but it's worth repeating for those of you who are new. I, somebody gave me a motorhome, and this satisfied a deep desire of mine because I had long seen myself traveling around the country, living in my own space in the motorhome, giving lectures, helping to draw people to God. And uh, the, when I got this motorhome, I let myself go. I just was so happy with it. I lay back and laughed and laughed and laughed. And I knew I would have to pay for it. But I thought, I don't care. I'm absolutely delighted to have this motorhome. Well, anyway, that same evening, you know, when you've gotten rid of your desires, then your karma gets paid for very quickly. They're not the, um, what was the expression master used? The what? Thro throttling cross currents of, e of ego. And uh, that same evening, I was perched with one knee on the seat, one foot on the floor, reaching up into a cabinet. And the motorhome had been parked, and then the person who was driving it went back to the um, refrigerator, not realizing that he had let, left the motorhome in gears. And so the motorhome was moving very slowly. He co you couldn't tell it was even moving. But suddenly it hit the side of the Safeway market and threw me onto the floor and broke my finger. And I laughed and laughed and laughed. I said, there, you see, is the law of duality working. It's just delightful to see it. But you know, everybody knows that if you get drunk, you're going to have a hangover. And the same thing is true of everything that you do. Every pleasure is going to be followed by a pain. I know Diamato mentioned to Master uh, she was having difficulty with moods. And he said that's because of your pleasures in the past and you're paying for them now. That's just normal. Everybody goes through it. But the more you can realize that any time anything good comes to you, withdraw from it a little bit. Give it to God. Don't let yourself be touched by it. When I was one time in, in school in England, there was this German uh, Jew. He was called Gunther Birkenau. And uh, I was up in the art studio, and I came out, and there was Gunther. And we were alone up there. He was quite a bit older than I and in a higher grade than I. I was just a little fellow. And... Uh, I remember he pushed me, and I, well, I had to push him back. So he leapt at me and threw me to the floor and began beating me up. And at that moment, some upperclassmen came in. They were afraid of him, too, and so they backed off. Everything's fair, everything's fair, and they closed the door behind him. But I, I just refused to let it bother me. And, you know, I beat him. Even though he beat me, he'd have left me alone from then on. Because he could kill my, he could hurt my body, he could even kill it, but he couldn't kill my spirit. So let your spirit always be indomitable, and no matter what you suffer, don't let it touch you or who you are. Well, I think it's time to stop. Thank you for coming. It's been my joy.